I'm Marissa Norcross. And I'm Dave Freund, and this is The Next Page. Marissa, how are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Now, see, I took the low, ri- the low road. This time. <laughs> I didn't say, I'm terrific. I'm, 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 I'm actually, I'm, I'm good. I, you know, I'm working through a migraine, but it's not that bad. So it's, I'm, I'm good to go. Mm-hmm. So we did something today that I don't know if we've ever done. Usually you and I talk a lot about the podcast before we hit record, mm-hmm. but today we didn't. Nope. Because we just need to see what happens. So when you saw the title of my post, what thoughts went through your mind? So it wasn't necessarily the title that got my mind going, but when I opened the document in, in my eyes, I always I, I always kind of scan before I read and, and certain words pop up to me. Uh, and I, I was very surprised. And I, I think what I wrote back to you was, wow, you went there. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> and, I did. And I, you know, I thought it was very um, brave of you to share. You're very vulnerable with, with what you were sharing. And um, I don't think you're alone in in that. Probably not. No. Well, you know, if I thought I was alone, I would just have this conversation with a therapist <laughs> instead, of, <laughs> instead of write about it. Right. Um, no. So now people are really worried, aren't they? So, so the title of the post is, but I just want to be liked. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I won't go into the details with, with our podcast listeners because they don't need to, to know what, what had me to this point. But, but I started realizing that it was way too important for me to be liked. And I, I think the way I put it, where I'm a person who wants to be liked by other people. And I said, probably a more accurate statement would be, I feel as though I need people to like me. It truly matters to me what people think of me. And the problem was that when I, I could simply say, well, that's my disc behavior. Mm-hmm. But there's a problem when you when you are so focused on making sure people like you. It's all about you. And our listeners have heard me say for, you know, two hundred and now three episodes. When you're a leader, it's not about you. It's always about the other person. So if that's the case, if I really need to be liked. And it's super important to me. Then I'm a hypocrite. Because it's not about them. It's about me then. Mm -hmm. And that's what really hit me. And and it was like, whoa, what? You know, and and I know that, see, I've battled, I've battled this need to be liked my entire life as, as a manager, leader type person. I mean, you know, it's one thing people ever, I think everybody wants to be liked. That's just a normal human emotion. But needing to be liked is different. And it can't, so I realized that it could not be about me and have me be a good leader. So I got to work on changing that. I have to totally change my mindset and get over the fact that it really, I shouldn't be living my life with this exaggerated need to be liked. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what were your thoughts when you read through it? interrogate me now yeah you know i i immediately thought about you know what and you don't have to share but i my, you know i was thinking about what made you come to this realization or you know you did say that you figured this would happen at some point so i was kind of wondering if if it was something or a collection of things that made you realize this or um if yeah so so I think it's a collection of things. Mm -hmm. I I think it's, you know, I, and it's not a surprise to anybody that I, that I'm highly intentional about learning. And, and every time I get a chance to listen to different teachings on, you know, the, the, the nuances of leadership, um, I try to do it. And I, and I, and I, and I am, I think I'm a student of leadership and, I realized I started hearing things about how important is it for you to be liked. And I'm like this is resonating and it's resonating mm-hmm. with something that I've been battling for 35 years let's say. Mm-hmm. You know, but I couldn't understand what was causing it. Um 
and and then also some some other things going on in my life right now where I've for the last many many years been very focused on you know just not 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 rocking the boat in some situations mm-hmm. you know not it's not that I'm I, I I'm not going to say I didn't waffle I didn't cave I didn't give in to things that I knew to be wrong but was I as willing to speak up as I needed to be you know and and what did keeping quiet actually do for me did it move did it move organizations did it move me did it get us into a better place because I was quiet and and the answer was no so not engaging didn't help and so it didn't and it also didn't make anybody like me anymore Mm -hmm. so then I had to say okay so what's wrong and I and and so when when you think about it the, the point is that a person that needs to be liked it's all about them. But we don't want it to, to sound that way. You know, but if if how I feel drives my interactions with other people, then that is only about me. Mm-hmm. It's not about them. And if I truly value that person and I hold back what they need to hear, I don't value them. Because so the point is, am I willing to take a risk and say something that might make me unpopular if it is really what's best for that person? So that's kind of, does that make sense? Yeah, I I think it it makes a lot of sense. And again, I don't, I don't think you're alone in that. I think you are, are lucky to have had this realization. I think um, it, 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 you said, you said the better part of 35 years, right? That you've, yeah. I feel like this has been how it is. And I think that this could be something for younger people to hear. Yeah. Too, right? If you hear this now and start doing this work now, then it wouldn't be something to carry for 35 years. Um, right. Your life will be so much easier. Yeah. Because you can't, you know, you, you, you can't, um, you can't please everybody. Mm hmm. And, and so, but oftentimes you'll hear this. So since you can't please everybody, you might as well just make sure you please yourself. No, that's not what I'm saying. (laughs) Not at all. I'm saying since I know that I'm not going to be able to make everybody happy all the time, I need to be speaking up and doing the things that are best for that other person and the organization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and if not, I'm no better than a politician. Which, you know, like nobody wants to be labeled one of those, right? <laughs> so, so what I did is I, I kind of dug into, I knew that somewhere in John Maxwell's book, Leadership, was a chapter about, because I remember something about making the shift from needing to be liked. And, and it really, it is a chapter. And so I, you know, I, I grabbed the book off the, the shelf and, and started looking at it, and I'm trying to even figure out what the title of the... Oh, the, it's chapter five that says, the shift is pleasing people to challenging people. Mm-hmm. You know, and John goes on in the book to talk about the fact that he really felt that he needed to be liked, and it mattered so much to him that there were conversations he wasn't having. So he, in this chapter, he says, you can't lead people if you need people. Now, we're all going to say that we need people, but we need people to make to help the vision come to to reality. We, nobody can, you know, one is too great a number, it's too small a number to achieve greatness of any kind. So we need people to come on our teams. It's the people that that bring our our dreams and our visions to fruition. However, what John is saying is, if you need to have these people be affirming you all the time, you can't lead them mm-hmm. because nobody wants to follow a needy person. And if you and those there are people that can hide it pretty well. I think I think I hid the fact that I was needy pretty well. And there were times and I will say that, you know, when it was a crucial situation, yes, I rose to the occasion and I didn't really care as much what people thought and I did what was right. I don't I don't think I ever didn't do what was right because I was worried what people would think. And nothing comes to mind when I when I reflected on that. But so John gives He's, he throws out three questions right at the beginning. He says, if you want to make sure that you're doing this right, there's three questions you need to ask. One is, what is best for the organization? 
This is like when you need to make a decision. What is best for other people in the organization? And then lastly, what's best for you? So at least we do get to come into the category, but the you know somehow we fit into the equation, but we come in last. Mm -hmm. But start with what's best for the organization. You know how many times do we do we tolerate mediocre or worse performance because we don't want to rock the boat? And and it it clearly it clearly is a, an abdication of leadership because what you're going to get is an organization that's just mediocre. Mm -hmm. So there were some there were some interesting points that 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 John made in that chapter. He said you really need to change your expectation of leadership. It's about challenging people. And if you think about it, so why do you know I've said this I and and I've and I've and I've heard this from other people. You know, one of my sons has said it. We don't have high enough expectations for people. So if I don't communicate, if I communicate low expectations for a person, I'm telling them I don't value them. Mm -hmm. I don't think they can do it. So rather than placating people, challenge people. And if you truly value people as much as you value yourself, you're going to give them your best effort, even when it comes to putting yourself in uncomfortable situations. Um. He, and so he also says, leaders who devalue people give them little effort. Leaders who value people serve them. Leaders who devalue people want to be served. You know, and, and, I, and that was something I really needed to check myself on. Do I feel like other people need to serve me? Because that's a real indicator that you're not valuing people enough. Um, leaders who value people empower them. Leaders who devalue people control them. That one stung a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because I like to say I'm a person that empowers people. But then I had to think back of how many times did I actually try to control what people were doing rather than empowering them to do what they thought was best. Um, leaders who value people motivate them. Leaders who devalue people manipulate them. So people would... You know, and, and, and as I think about that, a lot of folks might be saying, I don't manipulate my people. And I'd have to say, really? So um, what kinds of incentives do you put in place to get them to do what you want them to do? Mm -hmm. You know, we get manipulated. Mar uh, marketing manipulates people all the time. If, if you look at, you know, um, when we try to buy a car, you know, there's all kinds of incentives. That's manipulation. Um, when, they, when they show us pictures of, you know, the perfect family going out in the minivan, you know, the Norcross family going out <laughs> in the minivan to go work on their bucket list, that's mm -hmm. a commercial for a minivan company. Mm -hmm. Because if we want to have that family, buy my car. Mm -hmm. That's manipulation. Um, you know, when I was a kid, you know, Four out of five dentists choose Trident. I mean, it was just like, <laughs> that's manipulation. Mm -hmm. Nobody's saying this is a product that does this and this and this and this and this. It's, a, it's, you know, it's amazing. Would you like one? Mm -hmm. They're always giving us these images or somebody else. So that's manipulation versus motivation. You know, do I? And, 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 and I remember in, in a lot of my classes when I talk about motivation, I ask the folks, so, you know, Motivation is best described as an internal drive to fulfill a need. So I said, so how do I know how to motivate somebody? And they said, well, you got to get to know them. I said, you got to get to know what about it? Well, what do they like? What don't they like? What are their values? And, uh, exactly. So then we inspire people. We motivate people to do things rather than manipulate them. But to do that, I have to value them. So what, what surprised you so much? Just the fact that I was that open or what the topic was? Yeah, I think just that, you know, you were so open and honest in your experience and that you were, that you were publicly stating that you were committed to changing through, yeah, okay. by, by starting with changing your thought life. Yeah, and, you know, because, well, because we've always said, uh, you've always heard me say, mm -hmm. if you want to really commit to a change, make it public. Mm-hmm. 
So it's public. You know, this is this is going to go potentially around the world, so to speak. That Dave is <laughs> committed to being an overcomer in terms of needing to be liked. Mm -hmm. and, and and so it and maybe so I'm trying to think what else drove me to it. Uh, just finished last week. I did emotional intelligence and I started crucial conversations. Mm -hmm. And I'm finishing crucial conversations later this week. So that in and of itself has you thinking. What hard conversations am I avoiding? Why am I avoiding them? I'm avoiding them because I want to be liked. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. So that's kind of why. I, yeah, it, it, it was just, it was a culmination of things coming together at the right time to basically say, it's time to step up mm -hmm. and, and, and not be a hypocrite and, you know, really make the changes that you need to make. So one of the things, something else that, um, you know, John talks about establishing expectations up front. I think that's huge, you know, and I think back of, of times when I've, when I've hired people, I didn't lay out the expectations well enough up front. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what I need to see. These are my expectations. Any questions about what this is? If you have any questions, come see me. And then going and reinforcing those expectations on a regular basis till those expectations become crystal clear. Yeah. And I think one thing that, that I really like about communicating expectations is that it, it's two sided. So it can, right. you can say, this is what I expect from you. And this is what you can expect from me. Right. And, and what else do you need from me mm -hmm. to get what I need to get from you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that. And that, that, that ex, you know, expectate, if we want to, I believe that almost all conflict in life is a result of poorly made ex laid expectations. Mm -hmm. You know, if my wife and I are going out to dinner and we don't have a conversation of what we expect, one of us is probably going to be unhappy. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but if we would just lay out the expectations up front, it would be a much more wonderful dinner type of thing. Right. So, and I've, I've said that in some of my classes. Um, so the expectations up front is a really big, important part. But then John says this one. He goes, ask yourself the hard questions before any potential difficult conversation. And he's got a questionnaire in his book. And, and this, was, this, could, this could be right part of crucial conversations. Have I invested in the relationship enough to be candid with them? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Do I demonstrate that I value them as individuals? Am I sure this is their issue and not mine? Mm. Ooh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Am I sure I'm not speaking up because I feel threatened? Wow. Is the issue more important than the relationship? Does the conversation clearly serve their interests and not just mine? You know, there's so much truth in these questions. Mm-hmm. Am I willing to invest time and energy to help them change? Am I willing to show them how to do something and not just say what's wrong? Am I willing to be able to set clear, specific expectations? Have I previously addressed the issue or problem in a less formal setting? And basically what John says is if you have no in one or more of any of these questions, you need to go back to, to the drawing board, so to speak. Because hmm. no in any one of those tells me I haven't set the foundation to really be candid with this person and really have the conversation that needs to be had. Um, then he says, you know, when you have to have a tough, tough conversation, do it right. I, I, for my notes, I put here, crucial conversations and mastering emotional intelligence. You know, you got to get yourself right first. What and, and one of the great tips from Crucial Conversations is this. Ask yourself, what do you really want as an outcome? And then ask yourself, am I behaving as though that is what I wanted? So if we just, if we think of a relationship outside of work, relationship with a spouse, what I want is a wonderful relationship. Okay, am I behaving like that's what I want? Or am I behaving like I want my way? Mm -hmm. 
It's these these become really simple questions if you just can take the time to ask, right? Ask yourself. Um, this one surprised me a little bit. So John in the book he says, understand the 25-50-25 principle. He's always good on these percentages and principles and laws and numbers. And he said this. So this is a leader getting ready to lead a team. He said, 25% of the people will support your efforts. 50% will be undecided. 25% will resist the change. And then he said, don't waste your time trying to placate the 25% that you're going to resist. <laughs> he said, all you're going to be doing is giving them a win. Mm -hmm. So then he says, your goal is to, take, is to try to move some of the 50% into the group of the supporters. Mm -hmm. And like, wow. But if you think about it, how much time do we spend trying to convince all the naysayers? Don't bother. Just go with the undecided. It's a much easier sell. And then you'll begin to pull these folks into the, the camp of the supporters. And he said, and use some of the supporters to convince the 50%, which I thought was, was really great. Um, balance candor or care with candor. And I thought this was another interesting one because he gives you these two columns. And, and he said, care values a person. Candor values the person's potential. What that's such a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Care establishes the relationship. Candor expands the relationship. Care shores up weaknesses. Candor brings out strengths. Care offers comfort. Candor offers a challenge. Candor, care, excuse me, makes the team pleasant. Candor makes the team productive. So I thought, wow, there were some, some huge things there. So that's the way I'm going to. That's the way I'm reshaping my mindset. Uh, oh, and also, and I put this in my post. One of the reasons why people have an exaggerated sense of a need to be liked is that they don't have a correct level of self-esteem, mm -hmm. and they don't believe that they have what they need to stand up to people who disagree with them. And so for me, you know, just focusing more on, on my strengths, spending more time building on my strengths, um, you know, growing my, you know, working on growing, not, not arrogance, but a healthy version, a healthy amount of self-esteem, self-worth, um, and being, f and being fully settled on your convictions will allow you to have the hard conversations. Mm -hmm. But it always has to be based upon what is best for the other person and not what they think of you. So what do you think of that? I think that is very thought-provoking. Uh, and I think it'll resonate with a lot of people. Yeah, I think I'm probably not alone, like you said, mm -hmm. in, in having an, a too great of a need to be liked. Yeah. I think and it, it, there, it's like there there is a middle ground. It's not like you're either liked by everyone or right. disliked by everyone. It's like you said, you know, balancing care with candor. Um, mm -hmm. You're you're not saying oh, I'm, I I'm going to start being super strict and harsh and mean. Oh yeah, not at all. It's a it's just about being candid and and honest right. and and thinking about the interests of the organization and the interests of the people. Yes. And then your own interests. Right. And you know, I honestly believe this. If I'm, I'm kind of trying to put this thought into words right now. So this is raw content right here. Okay. <laughs> this is not even fully, fully baked content. If a person who is working to make that transition from needing to be liked, to truly valuing people and leading with the other person's best interest at in mind, I don't think the people that they are leading are really going to notice that big of a change. Mm -hmm. and because I think what's going to happen is, like if I, I want to be liked by people, right? But, but if, I, if I have a direct report that I don't, hold accountable to the expectations or maybe that I never laid the expectations out for 
and things go downhill and I end up having to terminate that person, I didn't gain anything from that relationship, nor do the other people in the organization. And they're going to think, well, Dave really didn't care. But if I'm willing to, to have the hard conversations, willing to sit the person down, willing to ask the tough questions that are best for the organization and that person, I really think you're going to be more liked. Mm-hmm. And people will know exactly who you are and where you stand. And people will, if you value people, people will like you. Yep. And those that won't like you would have never liked you anyways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the change so why, will really happen more internally. The change will happen mm-hmm. more internally, and it's going to be something that will be gradual. Mm-hmm. And when, and with retrospect, people will look back and say, wow, you know what? We didn't always like what he said, but we sure appreciate the fact that he said it. Because mm-hmm. we know that all he was trying to do was help us get better. Mm-hmm. And again, 25% of the people, you're never going to convince them, so don't waste your time. Yeah. There's better things we can put our energy into. Mm-hmm. So that's it. That is that is Dave's coming clean. <laughs> well, you know, I'm I'm excited for you for this journey. You got to keep me honest. Okay. Just you got to keep checking in. Say how you doing. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, there's going to be times when I'm going to fall off the wagon and just be, mm-hmm. you know, not say something that I should have said as quickly as I should have said it. But my goal is to just continue to, and I think the key is. Do I really value the people as much as I've been telling people I do? Mm -hmm. And if I do, it's going to come out in my care. It's like with our kids, right? Right. We don't hold back on saying things that our kids need to hear. And in the end, you know, take it from somebody who's got much, much older. I got kids older than you. (laughs) So in the end, you get rewarded for that. Mm -hmm. That's what I'll say. Mm Mm-hmm. Because your kids will say, you know, thanks for pushing me. You know, thanks for not letting me quit. That type of thing. Yeah. So, anything fun you're going to do with your lovely little girls and husband to work off your bucket list? We're, we're checking things off the list. Um, we planted some seeds. The girls are doing a... Um, Terrific. A little gardening activity, so we're kind of monitoring the growth of their little seedlings. So that's been fun, and that's awesome. I'm sure we'll do some more of that this weekend. How about you? Um, this weekend, I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, last weekend, I planted two pear trees. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's so that when I get a partridge, I can you know start getting back to my Christmas. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's so funny. No, I I had a couple of pear trees that I planted. Um. Yeah, I don't I don't have any real specific plans. Um just loving the season, loving to watch things come alive. Mm-hmm. Um working to get at some point I'm going to have to take some time and get my backyard prepped for a pool. So wow. That's supposed to come in July, so I need to do some landscaping first. And you know, the reason why we did it was we have nine grandkids. Mhm. And six of them live local. And Yeah. We would like them to come here rather than go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So that's why. That's awesome. So with yeah, so it's it's fun. It's exciting. Mm-hmm. And I can't wait to hear more about things you check off the list. Sounds good. So with that, I'm Dave Freund. I'm Marissa Norcross. And this was the next page. Mm-hmm.